ever seen the righteous forsake it. And he won't start now. Y'all give it up for the legendary Cody Carnes. Now, turn your attention to the stage for Take Away Five. Well, I hope you all have had enough turkey, and I hope you had a wonderful Thanksgiving. But uh, today, we have Erica here. Erica, I think uh, you and the ladies, this is sort of an elite group, isn't it? Yeah. I don't know if I'd say elite, because every woman is included, right? Well, that's what I mean. Okay. It's all the ladies. Okay. Yeah, it's so open. Yes, we're elite. <laughs> yeah. What's going on? Um, we are planning a very special evening for the women and um, a special Christmas dinner on Wednesday, December the 6th. December 6th. That's only a week away. Like a week almost. and a half away. Yeah. Yeah. And um, it'll be here in the path. It's a, it's a special evening celebrating the gift that Jesus is to us, and we have a great evening planned, um, very special dinner, a fun activity with cookie decorating, 
and Cassie Mecklenburg is going to be bringing us a special word and sharing from her heart. And it's not something any woman is going to want to miss. It's going to be fun. It's going to be connecting with each other yeah. and just celebrating together. So I can tell that I just feel already these ladies out here, they're really excited. And maybe some of them have not already signed up and they want to. Well, how can they do it? You can sign up on the app or you can email Jill Workman in the office. And since it's a catered dinner, we really need to know if you're coming or not. And I hope you all are coming, um, but we need to know so we can plan accordingly and have um, everything ready for you for that special evening. So if you know you can come, please let us know. RSVP as soon as you can, and then we can kind of get our numbers prepared. It is going to be a wonderful evening. It is. It's going to be uh, great. And just women, you don't want to miss it. A week and a half, Wednesday mm -hmm. evening, 6 yep. o'clock. 6 o'clock here in the path. Bring yourself. Oh, and we're going to be loving on sheltering wings. So if you could bring a gift for sheltering wings, that would be great. That's our domestic violence shelter that um, we love on. And they need Clorox wipes, toilet paper, curling irons, and hairspray. So bring any of that stuff, and we're just going to really love on, love on those families. Wow, that's season. awesome. Thank you so much. Yep, thank you. All right. And, and then today, we have a brand new person that's never been on our Takeaway 5 before. Uh, I think he's here. I don't see him just yet, but uh, I believe, oh, there he is, Dr. Henry Favorite. Now, that, now I was just joking I, with the doctor I'm part. a veterinarian. Yeah. Anyway, uh, Henry, I am excited about a brand new ministry that we've sort of expanded upon. I just want to give a shout out, though, to Scott Armstrong. He has done visitation for our church to especially the hospitals where people might be needing a visit. Uh, but we have uh, decided that we're going to expand on that. And you are going to be a part of that. So uh, tell us a little bit about you. Tell me something about you as far as your ministry background. Okay. This is scary because I actually started in Youth for Christ uh, over 50 years ago. And then gradually I worked my way up so that I'm dealing with the senior saints. I, I was a hospice chaplain for 12 years, and I learned that, you know, obviously hospice is not just for older people, uh, but there really is a, a need to reach out to people as we get older. So some of what they're asking me to do is continue this wow movement. And because of my background as a pastor, uh, visiting people, doing nursing home services, very similar what well, Stan, but also Scott has been doing for years. So they allowed me to come onto the pastoral care team. And because I'm not from the Nazarene background, I'm from the missionary church, uh, hopefully, not that there are new insights, but uh, We'll be able to reach all kinds of people. That's awesome. So here's the, here's the deal. Uh, if you were to go on the app today under bulletin, there's a, 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 a place there that says serve. And if you click on that, you will see the kinds of things that this team will be doing. And I said, we're expanding. Uh, we're so grateful for Scott and what he has done. And uh, just to be able to just add on to this is fantastic. But they'll be doing uh, home visits, hospital visits, if you need meds or uh, need to be taken to the doctor, all of that. But you can uh, just uh, register on the app and they'll uh, follow up with you. That's great. Thank you so much. You're I welcome. appreciate it so much. And now let's, uh, let's stand to our feet and prepare our hearts for worship this morning. flesh to save the lost grace and mercy displayed upon the cross our redemption he's the hope for all mankind one name over everything one name over everything Jesus over everything
join me in the response of reading this morning. Father, we are your children. Spirit, this is your church. Jesus, you are our Savior and King, and all God's people said, we will worship you and sing.
whatever comes your way, rain, storm, snow, anything in your life, he is there, he is with you. seated. Well, good morning, church. <laughs> My name is Aaron, and I am the worship leader here at Westside Church, in case you don't know me. Um, I would love to meet you if, if we haven't met, um, and even if we have met, I will meet you again um, sometime after service. Probably not right now, but um, well, I, I don't know about you all, but I had a, a really good Thanksgiving uh, I, I got to celebrate with my wife's family in the morning and then with my family in the evening on Thanksgiving Day. And then last night, my nephew got engaged. We had a big engagement party for him. Yes. Um, and, and so it's a great time with family and friends and just hanging out. Uh, but I'm, I'm done. Anybody else done? Uh, I, I love them. Like, seriously, I love my family. I love spending time with them. Uh, but I'm an introvert, so uh, this afternoon I'm going to be taking a nice long nap, if I can get one. Uh, but yeah, if, if, uh, if you're one of the unlucky people who, who did not have a really great Thanksgiving, I'm really, really sorry about that. I hope that this family here will welcome you and make you feel like you're a part of a family and you can feel the, the joy of Thanksgiving and, and celebration together, because that's what we're here to do. We're a family we're here to encourage one another, and we're here to lift up the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, I want you to think this morning a little bit about people that you love, or actually one specific person. Why don't you think about one specific person that you love? It could be a parent, a child, a spouse, girlfriend, boyfriend, even a pet, some, someone that you just love to spend time with and talk with. And, and do things together. The way that you feel about that person or animal 
is the way that God feels about you times 10,000 times 10,000, infinitely more times than how good you feel about that person. God feels that way about you. And I don't know about you, but that that's hard to believe, isn't it? That someone could love you that much and know everything about you. <laughs> that is pretty amazing. And that is the same God. That's the God that we are celebrating today. He's, he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. His love endures through the generations. And he wants to hear from you this morning. Speak to him the things that you need. And he wants to speak to you as well. Let's lift him up this morning. I'm calling on the God of Jacob, whose love endures through generations. that you will keep your covenant. I'm calling on the God of Moses, the one who opened up the ocean. I need you now to do the same thing for
Let's pray together. Uh, Father, there were some words in that song that said, you are the same. You, we, we don't have to be concerned that one moment you're one thing and another moment you might be something else. But there's a constant with you. We can come to you at any time, any place, and you are there ready to meet with us. In so many ways this morning, it feels like our world is out of control. There's so much chaos in our lives, it feels like, culturally, socially, politically, and yet we realize this morning that our, our faith is not in what is around us, but it's, it's in a God who can, who can take control of this moment of circumstances in our lives and in our world. And, and uh, we just are depending on you. Our faith and our trust is in you today. Be with each one that's in this place, those that are watching online. There are so many needs among us, dear Jesus, and you are more than able to meet every need. In a few moments, we're going to hear from you, from the Word of God. Father, we're here to 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 find out what it is that you want to say to us. And so we're opening our hearts and asking you to just penetrate our thoughts and our mind with, with what it is that you want us to hear today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you would remain standing and uh, in your Bible, Hebrews chapter 13, this will be our final day to be in Hebrews. And uh, I'm not asking that you read the entire chapter, but kind of just go down through there and there's going to be verses that will jump out to you. Just look it over, if you would, for just a few moments. And in response to the reading of God's words, we're saying these words. This is the word of God for the people of God. And all God's people said, amen. amen. You can be seated. All right, all right, all right. Good to be with you today. Hope everybody had a great Thanksgiving. This is always a, a unique weekend because there's like family in town. And if you're visiting today, so great to have you with us. And we know that college kids are home. It's good to see them. And many of our families are out visiting other families. It's one of those weekends where people are just everywhere. But I'm glad to be, I'm glad to be here with you today. So before I jump into the sermon, let me tell you a couple of things that need to happen this week to some of our church people. Okay, this is kind of cool. Uh, Mason Osweiler, fifth grader in our family, gave his life to Jesus this week. Isn't that awesome? Yeah, yeah. Mom and dad led him to Jesus. One of the most special moments for parents to lead their kids to Jesus. So you're probably going to see a baptism soon. So what a great Thanksgiving week. You're thankful. That's awesome. Proud of you guys. That's awesome. A church that uh, grows by leading their kids to Jesus has a future. Amen. So good. And this past week, one of our members, you may not know them, I don't, I don't know, um, Eric Sheets, been coming here for a couple years or so, um, several years ago had a story where he needed a double lung transplant. This past week, it's an amazing God story. The Indianapolis Star 
printed it, and then USA Today took it, and it went nationwide, like all over the nation. You've got to read this article. Soon we're going to have him come up and tell the story, because it's just mind-boggling what God did. And the whole story is about how God did something, and Eric shares his testimony in this. And it went nationwide. 350 million people kind of have access to this. So it's on our Facebook page. You can read about it, or just Google Eric Sheets, and you'll like you'll see it. It's awesome. So proud of you, Eric, for, for just letting God um, uh, tell your story. It's amazing what happened when you were from death's doorstep to God now giving um, great news. And I also want to say sorry to the Ohio State fans. I'm not a fan of either, but just want to acknowledge your morning today. <laughs> All right, there it is. Let's jump in. So we've been in Hebrews, there we go, Hebrews, since August 13. And we'll finish today, but before we do, let me let you know next week, here's what we're doing for Advent, starts next week, the three gifts of Christmas. We're going to talk about gold, frankincense and myrrh. And what is that all about? That are, those are weird gifts to give a baby. Gold, okay, sure, get it, yeah. But we'll talk about those each week, what they mean and why they were present. So there you go. Anyway, so we've been in Hebrews now, though, since August 13, 16 weeks, could have easily spent 50 weeks in this passage. And I noticed throughout Hebrews, maybe you saw this too, there were long stretches there where he was focusing on the same thing. It felt like he was beating a dead horse. It did. We would talk about as a staff, like, I got to preach on the high priest again and again and again and a sacrifice again and again and again. And those, those, are, those are great. But he kept on just lingering in those. And there was a lot of just content that are really familiar with those who are Jews or Hebrews, you know, uh, is, the Israel um, family, but foreign to us. But he spent a lot of time on those. Now, today, as he's wrapping up, he's spending very little time on some massive topics. Chapter 13, if you kind of noticed, it, it feels like a chapter of spiritual one-liners. Like there's some famous one-liners, right? Like, remember, where's the beef? I'll be back. There's some famous one-liners. And this chapter is like a bunch of chap, a bunch of like topics that are one-liners. It's almost like he was like rushed. I don't know. Like he spent so much time like writing this other stuff, it got to the end and I don't know, maybe he had dinner plans or something and just starts whipping stuff out really quick. Or maybe he was running out of paper. I have no idea, but it, felt, it feels like the end of this is just kind of rushed in comparison to what he's been talking about. But we can't talk about everything in this passage. I'm going to talk about a chunk of it, but not everything, but a lot of it. And then we're going to do something very special and unique at the end of the service today that you will not forget for some time. So let's look at a few of things. This is going to be like maybe a handful of like devotionals or short sermons because they're just different topics that aren't all connected to each other. So let's enjoy. Here we go. He starts off this, this way. Keep on loving one, or as, loving one another as brothers and sisters. All right. In other words, you know this, church is a family. We call ourselves one big family. One big family. That's what we call ourselves. Here's kind of how that functions, you know. God is our father. He gives that word to us, you know, in scripture. God is our father. It's like Jesus is like the big brother, right? Men are to be treated like brothers and fathers. Women are treated to be treated like sisters and aunts and grandmas, that sort of thing. Now, that's not a completely theological package. I'm not trying to do that. It's just a metaphor for how the church works, right? Older people are to be treated like with respect, like elders and younger are to be treated as those who need to be trained and brought up. It's a family. We work together. Church is a family, right? Um, this is, church is a family, not just an individual church like ours. But you could go on vacation. You could go to like, you know, Oregon for a week and visit a church and still feel like family, because that's how church works, you know? That's how church works. We're one big family, even one big global family. When you're born... You get a birth family. We all have that. Like them or not, you probably spent time with them last week. You may be sitting in the row with them now. You might see them at Christmas. Birth family, you've got one, like it or not, they're always with you, right? When you're born again, you get a new birth family. Now, if you love your birth family and your new birth family, you are doubly blessed. I've lived long enough to see that some people have both of those. We have both of those. It's awesome to have two sides, birth family and new birth family that are awesome. But I know some of you, like your birth family is either absent or gone. They passed away. There's strain. And you love your new birth family even like more than them. And that's a real tension for some people, right? I get it. God gets it. This family matters is kind of the point. In other words, this, these people are like your family. 
treat them like family. That's really what he's saying at the end of his letter. Just remember to love one another. That's how families treat each other. Yes, families fight. Yes, families, they fight differently. Yes, families have disagreements, but they love each other through everything. Support each other, help each other, encourage one another, lift up each other, build one another up. Keep on doing that is what he's saying. Keep on doing that. And then he says this, next line. Now, don't forget to show hospitality. You see, he's like, this is a completely different topic, right? I mean, there's some connection, but completely different. Don't forget to show hospitality to strangers. For by doing so, some, doing some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. I got to tell you, can I come clean? If this was not in the Bible, I would think that's insane, If that verse wasn't in the Bible and some preacher came up to me and said, hey, don't forget, you might secretly meet angels, I'd be like, you are cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. That's you. I would be, wouldn't you be that way? That's a weird thing, but it's in the Bible. So, yeah, there it is. But we got to explain that a little bit, right? We got to talk about that. Now, by the way, let's talk about two words. Only one is present here but because he's only focusing on one, but there's two things. Hospitality. There's another word in the church family that we use. It's fellowship. These are two biblical words that are different. Hospitality, fellowship. Fellowship is when you spend time with God's people, part of the family. You know, when you're in a small group or you have people over to your home for a meal or you go out to eat or you go on a trip together. That's fellowship with other believers, right? Encouraging one another, time with each other. Those matter so much. You need that in your life. Hospitality, theologically, um, has a couple reasons, but in the context of this, is with strangers, not saying people you don't know, but people who aren't a part of God's one big family with the aim to help them come to know Jesus. And you need both of those in your life. Now, angels. Let's talk about angels. I know. Weird. I, I, I get it. I don't talk about angels all that often. It comes up, right? It, there it is. Angels. Evidently, they can come incognito. They make cameos. Undercover. They're in disguise. Now, angels, we believe, are spiritual. They're spiritual beings but can manifest themselves in physical form at times. That's the case. In the Bible, they do that. They, they've come as fire. They present themselves as people at times, as smoke. You know, they're, they're, there's a variety of ways that they form themselves. One time, they come kind of through a donkey in a weird way. They, they, they can present themselves. But he's saying, in addition to those forms that the Bible says, they can also show up as people. This happened to Abraham. You know that story back in the Old Testament. Abraham is uh, visited by three angels, but he thought they were people and, and kind of entertained them and, and talked with them for a bit, had a whole encounter with them. It also happened with Jesus at the Garden of Gethsemane that the angels came. Really not really in people form, but they, they came to him and, and ministered to him. Okay, let's, transparent moment. Ready? Don't lie. I know you're going to think, people are going to think I'm weird. Who in this room thinks you saw an angel? Raise your hand. Okay, handful. Who of you, like, would say, I've never seen an angel? Okay, a few hands. Yeah, it's, it's a weird topic, right? It's like, they're like UFO sightings or Elvis sightings or Bigfoot sightings. Did we really see what we saw? It's like, well, you know, you're not sure what we saw, what it was, right? You're not sure. The key word here is not that you see angels and you know it. The key word is that you sometimes see it without knowing it. Without knowing it. That's the thing, right? Some of you may have met an angel without knowing it, because an angel, according to the Bible, I know it's a weird topic, different, their goal is not to draw attention to themselves, but to give attention to deflect to Jesus. That's what angels do. Demons do the exact opposite, but angels are about giving focus to Jesus. The angel Gabriel won't show up with a name tag and a halo and wings and say, hi, I'm an angel. It'll freak you out. That's why every time in the Bible, Every time in the Bible when an angel shows up in angelic form, what do they say? Do not fear. It's the first thing they say to Mary. Do not pee your pants. It's okay. The the shepherds, it happens a lot, right? So without knowing it. However, if you go to lunch today and your, 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 your waiter has a name tag, Gabriel, order the angel hair pasta and tip big. Just in case, right? I mean, you never know. Weird topic, but, but there it is. Hospitality to strangers. Now, let's dive into some other stuff here. Look at, this, look at this next verse here, okay? All right, he says this. Continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. All right, 
The Hebrew church, the Hebrews church, literally had people in jail. But not because they had committed crimes, as far as we know, right? That's not what he's talking about. They, they're not there because they've done, you know, murder or theft. They're in prison because they love Jesus, and they're being persecuted for this. That's what they were experiencing. Some of them had been. We read that earlier in the book. Now, this is a good verse for us in America in this room, okay? Because it's good for us to remember um, that others in the world are suffering for Jesus, even though we likely do not. And isn't it great that we don't suffer? I mean, I'm not going to lie. It's awesome that we don't suffer in some ways. I wish everybody experienced that. But the truth is there are many around the world, the globe, that are suffering in terrible ways. And we should remember them. Not just because it's good to think about them, but it calls us to action in whatever way God has for you. But let me show you some of the ways. And there's a handful. I'll, I'll move this quickly. But just so we actually honor what this verse says. I want to show you some ways in which people in our world are suffering these days. And some of this actually will be a part of your life and American life as well, just not to the extremes of this necessarily. Let me show you a few ways that, that people are suffering. Next slide here. So first way is tribulation. Tribulation is a word in the Bible that simply means there are some cultures in which it's generally just hard to live as a Christian. Now, every nation has always experienced this, always. Even we experience this to a degree, some large degree, some small degree, but that's what that word tribulation means. It's just unfriendly culture to live towards faith. That's why you come here to be boosted up in your faith, and you don't go to the mall to get that. It just it doesn't happen out in culture, right? Another way, way that p- Christians experience like, this suffering or struggle is poverty. Across history, being a Christian has cost some people money. It's cost people opportunities. Some people who believe in Jesus have lost their jobs, lost inheritances. In the book of Hebrews, they were losing literally their work, their jobs. That's where they were put into poverty. Another one here is slander. Slander is when you have your reputation destroyed simply for being a believer. Some people will say things that are untrue about you or your church or your faith. It's untrue. They will misunderstand you, misrepresent you, and just slander who you are. This happens to Christians generally all over the world, maybe specifically to you. Here's another one. Death. Now, that happens all over the world, shockingly enough, right? So We feel so far removed from this, but it does happen. I mean, it happened with all the disciples and Jesus, and ever since, people have been killed for their belief, either um, from... um, Opposing sides or a variety of things, just death, right? Then there's relational suffering that happens, relationship suffering that we need to remember that some people struggle with this. Some of you may have lost friends or relationship with a family member because you've given your life to Jesus. I know people who've done this. There was a guy in our church in Kansas. I remember he, he, was, he drank a lot and came to a point in life. He gave his life to Jesus and actually stood up front and publicly said, I'm not doing this anymore. And he said after that, his friends stopped inviting him to stuff. He still wanted to be friends. I mean, still like they were his friends, but he was out of their circle anymore because of that. You know, we lose people. How about discrimination? It can be social, institutional, employment, uh, legal, all kinds of discrimination happens to Christians. How about another one here? Next one is rejection. Just generally being rejected by people or society or someone you love or uh, someone you were dating or someone you're married to or, fam- you know, could be all kinds of things. Criticism, just generally. Well, in, th- in that day, Hebrews day, they would beat your body. Today, they beat your reputation. Now, in some cultures, they still beat their bodies, but here people can just trash Christians online, on Twitter, on TikTok, and in culture or whatever, which is so awesome that Eric Sheet's story went, glo- you know, g- well, global to a degree, but national for sure, telling the truth of who Jesus is. You could experience disapproval or also peer pressure is another one. Peer pressure is another way. Pressure to conform. We as Christians, especially in America here, don't face violent oppression. We face silent repression. They want us to shut up, stop telling the truth. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm not going to do that. I hope you don't do that as, as well. Not, we don't want to be pressured into doing stuff and thinking stuff that culture believes. That's, that's, a, that's a form of suffering. How about this another one here? Is next, here next slide is harassment, just generally being harassed for what you believe in all sorts of ways. Like the Hebrews, they put them in prison. They just made up a law. You can't be a Christian. We'll put you in jail. How about this next one? Demonic opposition. Let's just... Let's just admit that there's a lot of evil in this world, and Satan is working overtime against Christians, and he's causing very, very real suffering. 
to people. Always has been. Then there's collective suffering. Collective suffering is when a group of people collectively suffer because of who they are. Like the Hebrews. They lost their jobs, some of them. They had to help each other. They lost, some of them were thrown in prison. Some of them were harassed. They were just collectively as a group suffering. And lastly is vicarious suffering. Vicarious suffering is just like, hopefully that we do this, that we know there are people around the globe being literally murdered and we suffer with them by remembering that there are people dealing with severe, severe suffering. That's what he's saying. Those kind of things, we should remember those things. Those are all happening. Let's not forget those people. And while I'm at it, while, we, while he talks about the prison thing, I just want to say this as your pastor. This year we're doing like the angel tree in which we give gifts to kids in prison. They're on behalf of their parents who are in prison probably incarcerated there for all kinds of reasons. And you scooped up every one of those names. We had to order again and again. We could probably still order 100 more kids and get it. So I just want to say well done for that. Let's keep that up. That's going to be a, a connection for us. Awesome. Now, let's go into this. This is interesting. Next verse, he shifts topics. And he says this. Let's talk about marriage. We're going to linger here for a minute. Marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed be kept pure. For God will judge the adulterer and all the sexual immorality. Now, this word honor is an important word. You know, it's a good word. It means, it just means generally special esteem, deep felt special esteem for something or someone. And marriage is a good thing and should be honored by all. Here's what that means. Biblically, one man, one woman for life. That's what God wants us to honor. Admittedly, it's difficult culturally for many. I get it. It's never honored when it's between two of the same sex. And divorce should be rare. I know it happens, okay? And cohabitation is what we're going to talk about as well for a minute. This is two people living together, pretending to be married. Those things all dishonor marriage. And there's so many other ways in which we can dishonor marriage. Now, let's talk about this line, the marriage bed. The marriage bed. Because we're going to talk for a minute here about living together. This is one of the quintessential passages about that that I want to share with you from. If someone's living together and not married, they're sinning. Just plain and simple, just what it is, right? And that's, that's what it is, right? Living together can be like we live together in one place or we have two places with sleepovers. That's all the same thing. It's not honoring the marriage bed. We have words for this. We have like words like cohabitation, shacking up. It's literally called living in sin, like, it's got a label. Like, they, people know what it is. It's called domestic partnerships, that sort of thing. There is no such thing in the Bible. There's no category in the Bible for the boyfriend bed, or the girlfriend bed. It's the marriage bed. Amen, church? Amen. That's what it says. And I hope everybody who's not married is really hearing what we're talking about right now. The marriage bed is a symbol of the sacredness of marriage and how we ultimately honor marriage together. If you're living together and you're not married, Sinning, we know that, right? Now, this is a growing trend. It's been growing for some time. The stats I gather is half of all women cohabitate at some time. I'm sure that includes men too, but this is how it works. This is how it works, right? One half of all marriages these days are preceded by cohabitation. So it's, it's trending. It's all the rage. And the common argument, I've heard it, you've heard it. They've got the line down. But we're married in God's eyes. No, you are not. It's the opposite. Opposite in every way. And I'm going to explain why in a minute. Living together and marriage are two different things. Living together and marriage, two different things. Two people living two lives, sharing one bed, is not the same as one woman, one man for life. And I'm going to show you some differences here. So everybody gets this, okay? It's powerful, important. Let me show you some differences between living together and being married and how we honor marriage, okay? So one is the public private thing going on, okay? Marriage happens very public. And honor, to honor marriage happens very public. Like you get a proposal and it's very kitschy right now and fun to like do like a video. Like you get a videographer and they sneak and they take a video of your, your proposal and it goes viral. That's cool and it's fun. It's very out there for everybody to see. And then you get engagement pictures and it used to go in the newspaper, but now it goes on, you know, Instagram, right? That's fun. And then you send people like a save the date thing. Like it's very out there. And then there's a wedding. It's very public. You invite all your friends, or at least the ones that you like the most can afford, right? 
Oh, come on. That was funny. Right? It's very public. You invite people, right? It's very public, right? You stand before everybody and you declare vows in front of God and your family and friends. You share rings. It's all, you're declared publicly that you're married. It's all very public. Living together, not so much. Living together can happen in a whole bunch of ways. Sometimes it just happens between two people dating and like, and then you leave a toothbrush over. And she's had a clothes over, and then all of a sudden, like, nah, we're just there. Or sometimes, I've seen this one too, my lease expires, and we're going to get married, but like, I don't want to re-up my lease, I don't want to do that, let's just do that, you know, this, and nobody knows, and eventually, you say, how's this relationship going? Well, we moved in together, very private. That's how that works. Maybe not every time, but generally, that's how that works. Here's another difference. Oneness and twoness, okay? Marriage is one person, or two people become one flesh, one bank account, for example. Cohabitation is typically two people sharing like two bank accounts, two different things going on. It can be in one that you share one church. Sometimes these people share two churches or, or probably more likely zero churches, right? Two different things, right? Marriage is two people becoming one flesh, as it says in Genesis and Matthew, two people becoming one flesh. Cohabitation is two people staying two people until they see what happens. That's, that's where that goes, right? It's like two train tracks living together. We're going parallel, but we're not united together necessarily, okay? That's a difference. That's a problem in God's eyes because that dishonors marriage. Here's another reason. You got to get the biblical order right. The biblical order, I mean, most of the time living together, not always, but almost exclusively it's about sex. really is. Sometimes money factors into, right? People ignore all kinds of warning signs in their life because they want to enjoy sexual activity. Marriage, according to the Bible, is covenant, then consummation. In that order. Not consummation, maybe covenant later. That doesn't work. That's the difference between married and living together. Cohabitation and marriage, very different, right? Especially because, like, this is how it works. This is not old-fashioned. This is biblical. The man is the hunter in the relationship. He absolutely should be, okay? I believe in that. And when he has no longer to hunt anymore, it's unlikely that he will change his ways. Ladies, make it hard for him. Oh, yeah, make it hard. Amen, ladies? Yeah, make him pay for that ring. Make him, make him earn it, right? That's how that works. It's how it's designed for God to pull out his blessing in you. And they have this weird statement. I didn't make this up, but why Buy the cow when you get the milk for free, which is a terrible line, guys, for a gal. Don't ever call your gal a cow, right? <laughs> you will not be living together or married or living, probably, if you do that. But that's the statement, right? Long ago, we had a name for this, for a woman who would live with a guy for sex until he's done with her. It's called a concubine. That, that's where this came from. So ladies, just so you know, there's a history of this, and he can... He can make it all kinds of like um, flowery language, but if you're living, for him, living with him, you're a concubine. If his theology gets you naked and in bed, he is not a good Bible scholar, okay? Just so we're clear, okay? And if you get these things out of order, if you get covenant, covenant then consummation, if you get that out of order, God will not bless you. God cannot bless you. You cannot do things that dishonor God and his marriage and expect you, him to bless you. He won't. He'll reach and try to help you and, and redeem you, and absolutely. But don't live so that God has to judge you. Live so that God can bless you. There's another thing that's different, the giving of the bride. All right, so in marriage, this is, I'm surprised how many people don't know this, and some of you are like, I never thought of it. Do you know why we give the bride away in a wedding? And not every, everybody's a little bit different, but generally, you know, the guy's down front and the gal watches down with her dad, and the dad gives the bride away. It's because at the beginning of time, God created Adam, and he intentionally, on his own, and God said, it's not good for man to be alone, and then he br- creates Eve and brings her and presents her to Adam. God started this to bless the marriage, and the dad, has, how it's supposed to go, brings his daughter to the the man and presents her with blessing and authority, right? That's marriage. And living together, that doesn't happen. And by the way, dads, if you let your kids live together, I know it's on their own. You you can't control everything. But if some dude wants to live with your daughter, the answer is no. Honey, get my shotgun. I'm joking a little bit. I'm not going to shoot anybody. Get the idea. It's important. No. The answer is no because it's not of God. Another thing that happens here is just legal, right? In marriage, you have legal stuff. You know, in living together, there is no legalities. It's actually a train wreck when it happens, right? No legalities, right? Secondly here, 
is the holiness happiness. When you, this is the order. God wants you to be holy, and then you become happy. That's how marriage works. That's how you honor marriage. That is absolutely, God says he puts two people together to make each other holy, right? Living together is like, I want to shack up with them because it makes me happy. And you never experience holiness when you get these out of order. But when you pursue God first, happiness comes in the end, right? That's what happens. Another reason here is unity is different. Marriage does most everything together. Cohabitation can do a lot, but they still have separate friends, separate families, separate names, separate bank accounts, separate stuff. And then there's commitment is lastly, right? Marriage, one of the lines is in the wedding vows is marriage forsakes all others. Cohabitation, keeping the options open just in case this doesn't work out. That's how that works. It's contract versus covenant, okay? Contract versus covenant. A, a marriage is a covenant where you say, I will never leave you. I'll never forsake you, even if you drive me insane. This is hard, right? I get it. I'll never leave you. Contract is, let's see if this works out as a test, and if it doesn't, we'll break up. That's, that's what that is. I know everybody didn't say that out loud, but that's what that is. Some people say, it's practice for marriage. I've heard this too. It's a demo. It's a practice. We'll see if we get along, if we're compatible, right? I know, we test drive cars. We view houses. We visit colleges. No, you can take a test drive before marriage, but it can't include sex and living together, right? You can test drive a car, but they don't let you take it on a three-week vacation across the country, same thing. You can go visit a house and check it out, but you're not supposed to squat there and live for a month, right? It's the idea. People think that living together is practice for marriage. It is not. It's practice for divorce, statistically. Not always, admittedly, but statistically. The practice for a covenantal relationship that is blessed by God is when you're in a covenant relationship with Jesus that's the only preparation that you need. Having that relationship, cultivating the relationship with God that you have, and then that prepares you for a covenantal relationship with somebody else. It's the best we got, how God says it. This is why it says dating is your demo. Dating is your demo. Dating should be long. Long. It's different when you get older and when you're younger. I get it. I don't have a time frame in mind. Actually, I do have a time frame in mind for younger people. I think two to three years at least. Because you got to have enough time with somebody until you really get to the point like you know who they are and like, am I willing to publicly say I won't forsake you? Or do I find out that you're just nuts and I don't, I'm not going to probably follow through with that? I know that's a very crass way of looking at it, but it's the truth. You need time together to really get to know each other. Okay, long dating and then short engagement because... At that point, the temptation to be physical together is so strong that you should get, like, married together in an appropriate manner, okay? The bottom line of all that is this. God's way is the best way, and our way is the wrong way. Amen? God's way is still the best way. You may think it's wrong or old-fashioned. It is not. You can't say, I love Jesus and live in sin. It just doesn't work that way. And if that's your case... Let me, let me say it this way. Some people say, we'll get married, and that's how we get things right with God. Yeah, but first you've got to repent. We're, getting married is awesome, and we'll talk, we'll see, you'll see that later, actually. Um, but what you need to do, if that's your case, is repent to God. That means you actually move out of the bed together and then pursue marriage, right? Repentance matters, okay? More to come on that. Let's roll. He goes on to another whole topic right here. Money, okay? So we talk about sex. We talk about family. Now we're talking about money. All the big topics, right? Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God said, I never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I won't be afraid. There it is right there. The love of money. The Bible is not against money. It's against the love of money. That's a big difference. Actually, the Bible's very pro-money, like you should have money. You should work hard and get money. If you don't work to get money, you should starve. You know, you should set up a retirement, shrewd manager story, rich fool. There's a lot of stories in there. The Bible's pro-money, but it's not pro-loving money. Some bad things happen, according to this text and others, if you love money. You know what happens? Let me show you. First, if you love, God, if you love money, you will never be content. You'll never be content. You'll never be content. You'll never have enough. Instead of experiencing contentment, we experience greed. We want more. We want more. Greed is natural to us. 
According to Gordon Gecko, it's good. You know the story? Yeah. It's not. It's sinful, but it's natural to us. Contentment is not natural, and it must be learned by the Holy Spirit giving it to us. So if you love money, you'll never be content, right? Secondly, if you love money, you'll lose focus because you can be so focused on what you don't have, and you forget to focus on what you do have. Maybe this is why you don't have something that you want, because a good God, a good Father does not give gifts to ungrateful children. If you love money, you will have a migration of hope. Our hope should be in Jesus, absolutely. But if we love money, our hope can leave Jesus and go to stuff and things and bank accounts and that security. There's good in that, but not if we love it. If you love money, you'll struggle with your purpose because money is a terrible God and will never give you purpose. Gathering money will not lead to purpose, right? It never does. It becomes addictive. It becomes unsatisfying. It's like any other drug. It never gives you purpose. I find it interesting. Like Even like some of the greatest um, businesses in America are profitable because they don't worry about money. They don't worry about money. I'll give you an example. Chick-fil-A, right? Chick-fil-A is a uh, underlying principle called the Be Rich Plan. You know what a Be Rich Plan is? It almost sounds like they want to be rich, but they don't. The, the Chick-fil-A plan is for you, the consumer, to be rich. Like, spend as little as money as you can on their product and get as much as you can. That sandwich, that's why that sandwich is big. They maximize that. As a result, they make, uh, the average Chick-fil-A makes $7 million a year. Behind that is McDonald's with $2 million a year. They're blowing past because they want you to be rich, right? Same is true, like if, you're, if, you're, uh, if you uh, struggle with purpose, you're struggling with purpose, but if you, if you have purpose, God may bless you in ways that you never expected. If you love money, you'll worry more, because there's a lot more to worry about, right? There's a lot more worry that the IRS will take it, or somebody will steal it, or you'll lose it, or you won't have it. You worry about that. Next, if you love money, you will hoard, likely to hoard these things and not share. You can use money to be a blessing, or it will be a curse for you. And lastly, if you love money, you'll use people. Jesus says that right out of Jesus' lips. Money is to be used, not loved. You are to use money and love people. But if you love money, it's often the fact that you will, in fact, use people. Now, back to our verse, and look at this. Like, back to our verse, and he goes on. These are connected. He says, here's why you should run from the love of money, because God will never leave you, and God's your helper. That's what he's saying. God will never leave you, and God is your helper. Money will do neither, at least not in the long term. I mean, money's helpful, obviously, but not in an eternal perspective. It just doesn't. We don't treat money that way. We want to treat God that way, right? So God has not abandoned you is the point here. God has not abandoned you. Many people, they don't even know this. They're hoarding money or gathering money or loving money because of a fear that God has left them and God won't help them. Not true biblically. It's easy to believe that God is near when things are good, isn't it? When things are great, it's easy to believe God's blessing me, God's close. But when there's a struggle, when there's tribulation, when there's suffering, when there's a problem, we can feel like God's a million miles away. Just take God at his word. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. God's not a million miles away. He's closer than you think. He goes on, remember, your leaders... And imitate their faith. All right, interesting. So if you're a leader in a church, a pastor, a small group leader, or some sort of leader in any church, an elder, a deacon, a board member, be worthy of imitation. That's tough. Here's what that doesn't mean. It doesn't mean you're perfect. I am not perfect. No leader is perfect. We've all sinned, right? Here's what it means. It means that you love God You live according to the word, and you repent when necessary. You just model the Christian life for everybody around you, okay? Do that, all right? Next, he goes on to say this. Again, just quickly, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. For those of you who don't like change, Jesus is your man. (laughs) Some of you hate change, right? There you go, right? In other words, his character doesn't change. His word doesn't change. We need to change. He does not. You need to change. He does not. And then he says this. Again, they're just one-liners. Don't be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings. Doesn't it feel like he's just just riffing off stuff like here, like unconnected? But here's, here's 
There are 27 books in the New Testament. Hebrews is one of those 27. You ever wonder how we got those 27? How did like those compile? And there's a long story about that, but let me give you the short story. When Hebrews was written and 1 Timothy was written and and Philippians was written, and all the early books, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, when those works, books were written, they were circulating between churches. They were mailing them to each other. The church at Ephesus would, read the book of Hebrews and then sent it over to the church at Jerusalem, and they just sh- shipped them around so everybody could read them. And the apostles were overseeing this. And they all said, these 27 books, yeah, this is, these are the right books. These are the right, they've got the right stuff. They're not strange at all. They're correct. That's how that began. That's how that began, because... Hebrews and the New Testament are not strange teachings. Let me just tell you something. If you listen to strange teachings, you become strange. You with me? It does. There's some strange teachings out right now. This happened the other week. A lady shows up at the church with a manila envelope. I didn't see her. She gave it to my admin, Jill. Jill brings it to me and says, a lady just dropped this off. And my first thought was, is that filled with anthrax? What are we doing here? Open it up, and I get these weird pictures of this gal, like, show me pictures she's taken uh, of the sky. This one has pictures of crosses in it, okay? I know you can't see it. This one is a picture of a cross that, that showed up since Israel was attacked. She wrote on the back right there. This one is a picture, a rock that looks like a lamb she saw in the, in the, in the woods walking around. This one, I thought, surely that's an angel. She said, no, it's a, it's a, it's a horse. Strange teachings make people strange, right? Now, I'm picking on that lady. She loves Jesus. God knows her heart. It's probably, there's probably some stuff going on. I get it. My point is this. There are strange things out there. We need to know the truth about things. End times prophecies, giving money to any televangelist. No. Fortune telling. That's just stay to the, stick to the basics of the faith. Church, know the word of God so well. These 27 books that when something comes against you, you can immediately go, yeah, that's, that's off. That's off. I love you, but it's off, right? You got to know what strange teachings are, and you only know that when you know what the truth is. He says this. Now, I'm not going to read this to you, but this section here, I just jumped, right? He gives a couple markers of great worshipers. He's concluding, I'm almost done here, then we're going to do something unique to close. First of all, as, as one big family, we should give a sacrifice of praise, Let's be people who praise God. Amen, church? People who do that verbally, out loud. The Hebrews, he's talked about this earlier in the book. The way religion had been for thousands of years, you came with an actual sacrifice, a chicken or a goat, and they would sacrifice it. We don't do that anymore because Jesus was sacrificed for us. And he stands before God right now as your intercessor talking to God about you. So when we gather together, it is so appropriate for you to give a verbal sacrifice sacrifice of praise, an amen, singing the songs, an out loud prayer. It's, it's be those kind of people. Not that complex, but so easy to see how so many people are so reserved to even do that. If you are reserved to give a praise to Jesus, I wonder how he'll reserved he'll be on Judgment Day to talk to you about God, to talk to God about you. I, I don't know. Something to think about. Next, we profess his name. We profess his name. We are people who love Jesus. We profess his name above all names and his way above all ways. Amen? Just like Eric Sheets did this last week that went nationwide, his story. So cool. We want to do good. Also do good, right? Uh, I, I talked to you about it this past week at, at, or last week at those dinners. If you haven't heard, it, you'll hear about it in January, this thing called the Say Yes to Jesus Fund. I can't wait to see what you're going to do with the Say Yes to Jesus Fund. You find the project, we'll fund the project to do good works. Awesome. Let's do it. Generosity. Share with others. That's people who are generous with each other. That's what God wants us to be. Culture, here's what culture does. Culture does in church the opposite. When you get paid and you make money, they live, then they save, then they maybe give. In that order. Live, maybe save, probably save. Maybe give. Jesus wants us to do the opposite. Give, then save, then live. That's how we be as Christians, to be generous. That's how God lived for us. And then submission, submit to godly leaders. Now, across the course of your life, you're going to be under lots of godly leaders and pastors. I'm one now. Who knows who you have in the future and children's pastors and youth pastors and all kinds of stuff and leaders in your life. Submit to them. Why? Because... They're doing it right. They point you 
to Jesus, which the rest of your life, however your life goes, wherever it goes, whenever you're picking a church or picking a pastor, make sure you get one who tells the truth and points you to Jesus. They're easy to submit to if they do that, or easier to submit to. Lastly is, oh no, go back to that slide. Go back to that slide. One more, he says, don't be a burden for them. Be a blessing to this one big family, not a burden. Now he goes on this very last thing he says, and then we're going to be done. Uh, Next slide. He wraps with two great words, grace and peace. I put them in yellow so they really pop. Grace and peace. Amazing two words, extraordinary words. Grace is what God does for you. Peace is what God does in you. And man, our world needs more of both. God's willing to give it. We just need to receive it. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. Peace is the result of grace. We live in a graceless world. We live in a cancel culture world. We live in a critic culture world, a world that lacks grace and lacks peace. We lack peace because we lack grace. They're connected together. And in your life too, if you have a lack of peace, It's because you haven't really received the grace that God wants to offer you and you really haven't responded to it. In repentance, we get grace and that's how we get peace. Many people don't or haven't really repented and so they've they've never really received grace. I hope that's true of your life today. You can give your life to Jesus today. You can receive his grace and have his peace. So here's what we're gonna do in closing. This is gonna be unique, special, and fun. We're gonna talk to two people today who want to publicly repent of living together. This is going to be intimate. It's going to be powerful. And probably the thing you remember about the whole day is, I don't know that I'm going to get through this. Just so, where are the tissues moment, right? Two people who want to publicly repent and receive grace and peace. So I'm going to invite down front here. I'm going to move my stuff here. I want Dallas to come join me here. Dallas Staggers coming up. Everybody welcome Dallas. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. So I'm going to... I'm going to tell your story and Jen's story, and I know not everybody likes to share publicly, but if I miss anything, you just pipe in, right? But I'm sure, I bet you don't. <laughs> but I miss anything, and in a moment, we're going to marry them, and we'll tell you why, okay? All right, so, and we're not going to do any closing song today, we're just going to do this. So Dallas started attending our church about three years ago, right? Something like that, about three years ago, and came out of, long story short, 17-year marriage that kind of just went disastrous in, in many ways, 17 years. I'm sure there were some good years in there, some good things, but came, it came to an end, and towards the end of that, um, Dallas just dove head first into alcoholism, got alcoholic, and, and he's been sober several years now, so that's awesome for you, man. Not alone, and there's others in this room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he came to a point that the marriage ended, and like he was on death. That's bad, actually. Hospital, right? With alcoholism, said, we got to get some things right with Jesus in my body. So he came to church, gave his life to Jesus, got sobered up, went to AA, and, and uh, kind of on that trajectory. And like everybody else, like Hebrews says, that sin so easily entangles, and that's Dallas' life had gotten there. Some of you know this. Some of you have had the same story in this room, right? If you have, you need to make sure you meet Dallas after this and say, hey, me too, brother. You know, I got, I got, my, got my coin as well, right? So, he was going through that. Now, AA doesn't recommend this, but at AA, met a gal, right? They don't recommend that because you're supposed to get there to get help. But hey, what happens, happens, right? When, when Cupid shows up, Cupid shows up, right? So Dallas met a gal, Jen, at AA, also having come out of a lengthy marriage that ended disastrously. Neither one of Christian marriages, you know, ended disastrously. And they, that is, is what it is. Also alcoholism, and she's been... Sober now, too, for some time, helping each other in that journey. Through this time, they spark kindled, and, and through a matter of things, they began to live together, right? Actually, I didn't even know this. So, and I know about, about a month ago, you officially got engaged, right? About a month ago. A month ago tomorrow? Yes, tomorrow. All right. Did you get down on one knee? Yes. All right. All right. We love it, man. That's a man right there. Love it, right? All right. So, um, got, got engaged, and I saw that, and... I didn't know you were living together, but I went, okay, this is, this is the thing. This is God's timing because I knew that these last three chapters, including today, was all about living together. It came up three times. I went, okay, God, you designed all this. It's, it was your deal, right? So you, you guys emailed over the church and asked for the wedding packet, and the wedding packet says 
on there that we do not marry people who live together. We just don't because we say that, you know, you can't just say you love God and not willing to repent. You can't live in sin and like stand before people and say, I love God. We just don't do that. Same with baptism. We, just, we don't do it, right? You got to like actually be living for God before you can do a Christian marriage, right? So met with them. We sat down. We talked about this. Your plan was to get married next October, right? And, uh, and, and knew that, and you even said to me, you, you used the line. You said, yeah, we're living in sin. We know it. And, but you said, we, we want to get things right, you know? And I told you, I'm not coming down on you. I'm not, not beating you up. I just wanted to present the, the truth to you. And I, and I really knew that the three weeks in a row, this topic was going to come up. And I thought, oh, they can't come to three weeks in a row thinking I'm pounding on them specifically. <laughs> Hebrews came up with this idea, not me. So we sat and talked. We talked for a while and uh, gave some options. And um, the two of you, we talked last week, like, why, why wait? You've done long dating. Short engagement makes sense. You were thinking about next year. And so Dallas this week moved out of the wedding bed, awesome, or out of the mar- out of the boyfriend bed, whatever we call it, out of the bed separately in repentance. They came to me last Sunday. Says we want to do things right. We want to repent and give our lives to Jesus and do it right. Isn't that awesome? Yeah, yeah. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna marry him right now. We're gonna because because what happens? Yeah, you can woo. Yeah, you can woo. All you want right? What happens is what sin so easily entangles, right? But God so easily separates and makes things brand new. Don't you believe that, church? Amen? That's powerful. So we are one big family. Both of them before got married in courthouses. Not special. Not before God. Not with the church family. So we're going to do it right with them right now. It'll be fairly quick. We're just going to get to the things, right? We're going to marry them right now. So I want everybody to stand like you do when a bride comes down. Let's turn some lights up. Here comes a bride. Bring her on down. Bring Jen down. Church, you may be seated. All right, Dallas and Jennifer, talk about doing things public. <laughs> Proud of you guys. Thanks for letting me share your story. Um, we will give God the credit in that story. I know you do. I know you want to do things right in the eyes of God. And both of you giving your life to Jesus and you stand before here, repentant of all things, you know, and that's a special thing. I want to get things right with God and God always honor God people who honors marriage. Amen? Amen? So you've gathered together today to marry you. Genesis 2.24 says it real well, that a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. In marriage, you become one flesh. Isn't that so awesome to know that God's brought you together to become one flesh? Not two people living in separate lives, but one flesh. I promise you it's a hard thing. It's a difficult thing. It's a difficult thing to, uh, to do marriage. Everybody knows that, Right? But it is a wonderful blessing when we do it God's ways. Marriage is God's idea, not culture's idea, not the government's idea. It's God's idea. That's why God brought Eve and presented her to Adam. You got your son presenting you today as the surrogate representative. That's so awesome to have God bless this marriage. And this is a covenantal relationship now, not a contractual one. Not a, not a contract, but a covenantal relationship that comes with all the blessings and benefits of that. Dallas and Jen, I require and charge you both as you stand in the presence of God to remember that the commitment to marriage is a commitment to permanence. It's the intent of God that your marriage will be for life and that only death will separate you. If the vows you exchange today right now before everyone be kept without violation, and if you seek to know, always know and do the will of God, your life will be blessed with his grace, and you will abide with his peace. All right, Dallas, we have this woman to be your wedded wife, to live together in God's ordinance in the holy state of matrimony. We love her, comfort her, honor and, seek, and keep her in sickness and in health, and forsaking all others till death do you part. If so, say, I do. And Jen, will you have this man to be your wedded husband? 
to live together after God's ordinance in the holy state of matrimony, where you love, honor, and keep him in sickness and in health, forsaking all others. Keep yourself only to him so long as you both shall live. If so, say, I do. All right. Repeat after me. Look at her, but repeat after me. I, Dallas, take you, Jen, to be my wedded wife, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish, till death do us part. Now, Jen, you do the same thing. Repeat after me. I, Jen, take you, Dallas, to be my wedded husband, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish, till death do us part. Those vows, if you live according to them, Dallas and Jen, that's how you honor marriage, and God will honor you because you do it. They have rings today, right? You have the rings? All right, pull the rings out. Yeah. Go ahead and place the ring, Dallas, on her left finger. And uh, notice something about that, that that ring is a perfect circle. Doesn't have a start, have a finish, right? You see, see that? You can't tell where it begins. That's God's love for you. God says, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. His love has always been and it always will be. And that's the love God wants you to have for each other. Dallas, look at her and repeat these words after me. This ring I give you as a token of my love and as a pledge of my fidelity. Now, Jen, take the ring and put it on his beefy left finger. Dude, <laughs> shake hands with you. And repeat after me, Jen. This ring I give you as a token of my love and as a pledge of my constant fidelity. Fidelity. Jesus, thank you so much for Dallas and Jen today. They, they've come to a moment here, Lord, that a lot of people don't have such a kind of a dramatic thing. But you brought them to this moment to confront an issue in their life and brought them to a specific time when these passages would come up in Hebrews to give them grace. You didn't smite them. You didn't harm them. You gave them grace. You brought them to repentance. And what Satan was trying to entangle in their life, you straightened out. Wow. Thank you, God. I pray your blessing over this marriage. For the rest of their lives, let your Holy Spirit abide with them and through them. In beautiful days and in hard days, I pray, Lord, your blessing and anointing over this marriage. We love you, Father. And all God's people said, I now pronounce, now, that you are husband and wife. You may kiss your bride. All right, take her on out, man. Take her on out. Yeah. On your feet, church. Just stay where you're at, church. On your feet. Yeah. All right. We don't see that every day. In the gra- stay in your seat. Stay in your feet. It's so good to see God give grace and peace to somebody. They're going to actually be over that door with us. If you want to greet them, get to know them, you should do that. Have a great day, and may the grace and the peace of Jesus Christ be with you all.